Tonight, Alafio Voyo Obalamidi Adeyemi III dies after over five decades on the throne and he's buried according to Islamic rites in a ceremony attended by prominent citizens. Tributes pour in for the monarch. President Buhari and other leaders describe him as a nationalist and a foremost custodian of tradition and culture. Bomb rips through Nukai Market in Jalingo, Taraba State. The second explosion in three days, many people injured. And six people killed after an apartment block in the city of Odessa was hit by missiles and Russian forces' latest strikes on a major urban center in Ukraine. And on business news tonight, Nigeria's forex reserves sustain upward movement as coffer increases by $59.9 million week on week. Nigerians today woke up to the news of the death of Obalamidi Adeyemi III, the traditional ruler of the ancient Oyo kingdom. The Alafi, who died at the age of 83, was one of Nigeria's top traditional rulers and is considered to be the longest to have sat on the throne reigning for over five decades. Obadiemi, who hails from the Alowolodu ruling house, is reported to have died on Friday night at the Afe Babalala University Teaching Hospital at Dwekiti. He has been buried according to Islamic rites. It's the end of an era in the ancient city of Oyo as residents walk up to the news of the passing of their king, the Alafio for your kingdom, Obalamidi Adiemi III. <laughs> Sons and daughters of the town express their disbelief on the transition of the great monarch, but soon they accept the inevitable. Like other residents of the town, the immediate family of the late Oba, though shaken by the incident, they also have come to terms with the loss. It's a pity we lost a man who has given Oyo his true name, a man who has truly represented Yoruba culture and heritage, a man who is a symbol of Yoruba tradition, a man, an epitome of knowledge, wisdom, a man who is truly a monarchy, in the Yoruba sense of it. It's gone. But what can we do? We can't create the Almighty God. Islamic prayers were offered for the repose of the soul of the monarch. <laughs> Some of the mourners who knew the king eulogized him. A careful examination of the legacies of Baba will confirm that he was in a different class entirely. In terms of everything, in terms of his brilliance, in terms of his intellectual depth, in terms of his philosophical understanding, in terms of his commitment to culture and civilization, in terms of his understanding of our history, in terms of his bravery and commitment. He was a scholar. He was a philosopher king. He holds some very, very good values. You know? Love, he preaches love. Baba, you will remember him and you will laugh. Do you want to Remember the way his dance steps, the way he dances, um, the way Baba is, is just too much. And his dressing as well, you know. We love him, but God love him most. The kingmakers and chiefs in council say, with traditional rights concluded, attention now shifts to the enthronement of a new king that will be acceptable by all. As Oyomi see, that is different from other systems, there are traditional rites that must be observed, and we thank God it was a success. We pray that the next king that God will choose should be a kind person who will care for Oyo town and Nigeria as a whole. His Majesty Lamidi Adeyemi was born on October 15, 1938, into the Alolodu dynasty and enthroned in 1970, after the passing of his predecessor, Badigesh Ladibulu II. Many have described his 52-year reign as purposeful with intellectual and cultural depth, living indelible memories in the sands of time. Bukola Oriowu, Channels Television News.
President Mohamed Buhari has condoled with the government and people of Oyo State over the passing of the Alafi of Oyo, whose reign covered major historic transitions in the country. In a statement by his special advisor, Mr. Femi Adishino, the president notes that uh, the late monarch's numerous participations in national meetings and conferences to shape the future of a country have been instructive. And the living words of wisdom he shared at every opportunity and unity and people-focused governance. In his words, the Alafi of Oyo's 52 years rule was remarkable in many ways. Most significant was the emphasis he placed on human development, thereby encouraging learning as a culture and formal education as a necessity while promoting values of peace and stability. Well, tributes continue to pour in for the Alafi of Oyo, one of the traditional rulers that played a prominent role in Nigeria's political history. He is believed to be a uniting force, while also playing a fatherly role to most politicians in the country. We'll hear some of the tributes from leaders across the country. For the late monarch, former president Chief Olusegun Obasanjo has described the late Alafi of Oyo as a symbol of the nation's epic struggle in self-discovery and self-actualization. He says Oba Adeyemi stood out as a voice for forthrightness in national affairs and he was as well a fervent promoter of mutual tolerance and understanding, not only among the diverse people who live in his domain, but also across the country. Governor of Oyo State, Sheyi Makinde, who is the chief mourner, also described Oba Adeyemi's death as a personal loss to him. In his words, Oba Adeyemi was our last man standing in the rank of most eminent royal fathers. With long years of leadership, he became an institution and an authority rolled into one by virtue of his immense experience, wisdom and understanding of Yoruba history, royalty and politics." Unquote. Kogi State Governor Yahaya Bello also expressed sadness over the death of the highly revered Alafin of Oyo. Governor Bello notes that the nation has lost one of its most iconic and experienced traditional rulers. According to Governor Bello, Oba Adeyemi distinguished himself as a true leader who pursued the peace, unity and development of his people. The River State Governor Yesom Wike also commiserates with the royal family and people of Oyo State, describing the late monarch as a man who dedicated his life to the service of his people and country. Governor of Benra State Samuel Otom also paid tributes to the late monarch, describing him as a brave king who was conscious about the peace and unity of his kingdom and the nation. His Royal Majesty no doubt lived life to its fullest. He was not just a custodian of the Oyo culture, but a man of wisdom and indeed a very influential figure even amongst his colleagues. In this next report, we'll bring you the life and times of the late Alafi. Lamidi Adeyemi was enthroned on November the 18th, 1970, and then moved into the palace after completing the necessary rites under the tutelage of the Oyo Missi, the kingmakers. The Alafi of Oyo, Obalamidi Olaiwala Atonda Adeyemi III, was born on October the 15th, 1938. Obadeyemi succeeded Alafi Marigeshi Ladigulu II in 1970. He was known and addressed as Ikuba Bayeye. He is a custodian of the culture of ancient Oyo kingdom. <laughs> was a source of prestige and now all over. Obalamidi Adeyemi III began his education at a Quranic school in Isai. After his primary education, he was offered admission into Igbobi College and St. Gregory's College of Balinde in Lagos. He chose to attend St. Gregory's College. After his education, he worked briefly at the Royal Exchange Assurance in Lagos. Obalamidi Adeyemi III was a lover of boxing, a sport he cherished so much. As a permanent chairperson of the Oyo State Council of Obas and Chiefs, Oba Deyemi III showcased royalty at its best. In 1979, he was honored with the national honor of a commander of the Federal Republic, CFR, at the National Theater, Igomu, Lagos. 
The federal government appointed Kabyesi Alafin Lamide Adeyemid III as a pioneer chancellor of the newly established University of Sokoto, now Uthman Danfodu University, where he spent 12 years. He was in his second term as chancellor of the University of Meduguri in Borno State when he joined his ancestors. The Alafi was a notable socialite and was last seen at the coronation of the Olubado of Ibado land of Alekon Balugu. He was married to 13 wives and blessed with many children and grandchildren. Well, away from the tributes to security now, at least five persons have been injured in yet another explosion in Taraba State, this time in Jalingo, the state capital, shattering buildings. The incident took place on Friday night at the entrance of the ward head's house, where local gin, popularly called Burukutu, was being sold. The incident coincidentally took place at exactly the same time when the state governor, Darius Ishaku, was hosting Muslim faithful at the government house to break their fast. Barely three days after a bomb explosion killed no fewer than six persons at Iwari, a suburb of Adokola. Another explosion has rocked a drinking joint in Jalingo, Taraba State, leaving no fewer than five persons injured. In palpable fear, residents of the area watched helplessly as the anti-bomb squad of Nigeria Police Force garnered details of the magnitude of the explosion. Eyewitnesses disclosed that two men riding on a motorcycle dropped the device near a drinking joint under a tree and drove off shortly before it exploded. With no death recorded, these lucky survivors narrate their ordeal. Immediately we passed this spot, then the bomb exploded. And then so many people were injured around the area, but thank God we, we, we were able to escape with my sister. The bomb was dropped behind my house, where they sell Burukutu. As I stepped out, I saw about eight persons injured, and the police arrived and took them to a hospital. I was selling there, so I wanted to go and pick up and sell, put for some people. Before I could know it, I just heard a sound and the thing hit my ear. While this was ongoing, the state governor Darius Ishaku was also hosting Muslim faithful at the government house to break the day's fast. The governor, shortly after getting the report, mounts the podium to seek for prayers. The first time we had bomb this year was at Mutumbiu in the church. And this is the second one and more deadly in the market square. We'll ask each and every one of you to continue to pray for the peace of Taraba, for the peace of Nigeria. For many residents, the state government alongside security agencies must develop drastic security measures to nip the situation in the bud. In part two after the break, mixed reactions trail the call for interim government by renowned legal luminary Afe Babalola. Stay with us. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on channels, television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Alafi Ovoyo, Obalamidi Adeyemide III, dies after over five decades on the throne and he's buried according to Islamic rite in a ceremony attended by prominent citizens. President Muhammad Buhari and other leaders describe him as a nationalist and a foremost custodian of tradition and culture. Bomb rips through Nukai Market in Jalingo, Taraba State. The second explosion in three days, many people injured. And six people killed after an apartment block in the city of Odessa was hit by missiles and Russian forces' latest strikes on a major urban center in Ukraine.
many people have been killed after fire engulfed an illegal crude oil refining site in Abezi Forest in Ohaji Bema local government area of Imo State. Witnesses said the incident happened around 11 p.m. on Friday, but residents of the area woke up to see the huge flames on Saturday morning. It remains unclear how many people were on the site when it ignited, but figures from witnesses range from 50 to over 100. A source said people were unable to go close to the bush at first because of the raging fire and had to wait for the flames to die down before venturing close. When they got to the scene, they were said to have found out over 100 persons had been burned and many others sustained serious burns. Videos of the scene of the legal refinery hours after the flames went out depict the extent of the deadly blazes impact charred equipment, vehicles and human remains lit at the scene. We'll stay in, in Imo State. A peace and security summit held today in Olu, inquiry local government area of a state. Well, the aim of the meeting was to brainstorm and come up with modalities to end insecurity in the Imo East Senatorial District, which has been badly hit by violent attacks. Imo State is perhaps one of the states in the southeast with the highest challenge of insecurity. Well, last year, the country home of Governor Hope Ozadima was attacked by gunmen. And just last month, the country home of the President General of our amazing Debo, Professor George Obiozo, was raised. Several police facilities in the state have also been attacked, among other security breaches. Alu is deliberately under attack by both internal and external forces. But the good thing is that we have a government that an Olu son, like Opu Zodema, is at the head. <laughs> With my experience in politics and the knowledge of power management, at the risk of sounding immodest, I can never with this coat of arm, be intimidated. I can never. The difference between me and some people who think they are politicians is because I want to be remembered for good. It doesn't matter to them how they are remembered. But I want to be remembered for the good things I have done for my people. Not by the number of people that died as a result of my confusion. I don't want to be identified with the murder, letting blood, standing my hands. I am a confirmed by my own personal assessment, a true and good Christian. I believe in God. A sad day in Kogi State today as gunmen killed three police personnel on duty during an early morning attack on a police station. Sources within the community told Channels Television that the attack on the police facility in Agaminana, a community in Adavi local government area, took place around 2 a.m. and residents were alerted when they began to hear gunshots from the police station. They explained that the gunmen, numbered about six, attacked the police station from different directions and succeeded in killing some of the personnel on duty. Mr. William Ayer, the police public relations officer in the state, also confirmed the incident in a statement, saying the attackers who were eventually repelled by the men on duty and operatives of quick response unit fled with gunshot wounds as they could not get access to the station. He noted that the commissioner of police in Kogi, Edward Ibuka, has ordered the deployment of a team of tactical operatives to the area to restore normalcy. And over to the nation's capital, where presidential aspirants, including the national leader of the All Progressives Congress, Shawaji Bolatinubu, Governor Dave Omai of Eboni State, the Minister of Labor and Employment, Dr. Chris Ngige, Governor Bala Mohammed of Bochi State, are attending an iftar dinner hosted by the wife of the president, Mrs. Aisha Buhari. The dinner is a private event and it's holding at the old banquet hall of the presidential villa. Other dignitaries at the event, including Malam Nasir El Rufai of Kaduna State, Minister of Niger Delta Affairs, Gautu Lapabio, one time national chairman of the People's Democratic Party, Barnabas Kimadi, and former Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. Yakubu Dogara. Uh, Mrs. Buhari had invited all presidential aspirants across political parties to the Ramadan Iftar. Journalists are currently barred from covering the event. 
The former secretaries of the government of the Federation and PDP President Jalasperin for the 2023 governor or general election, Senator Ayim Pius Ayim, is promising an all-inclusive government that will recognize people with disabilities if he is elected as Nigeria's president come 2023. He made the promise in Abuja where he hosted a community of physically challenged people to a dinner on Friday night. Senator Aim appeals to the group to support his ambition to become president, assuring them of special recognition in his government should he be elected president of a country in 2023. Until the least of us is recognized and engaged, the rest of us shall never be fulfilled. I will not be fulfilled until every segment of our population is recognized and engaged. Trust me, when I become the leader of the party by virtue of being the president of Nigeria, I will implement that. I will make sure that persons with a disability have special place in that activity. And I will have an advisor for people with disabilities. That inclusiveness is what I want to bring to bear on the leadership of this country. And that is why I have come today for your prayers, I have come today for your support, I have come today for your partnership. We'll stay with governance. Legal luminary Afe Babalola is insisting that his call for an interim government before another general election in Nigeria is popular among the ordinary Nigerians whom he speaks for. The legal icon believes the Buhari administration should be willing to adopt the suggestion to suspend the 2023 election and opt for an interim government to give Nigeria a new constitution. He calls on those misinterpreting his words to get the detailed explanation which places the responsibility of setting up an interim government on the National Assembly. Earlier on, his proposal had drawn criticism from various quarters, including a caution against anarchy and constitutional crisis. I'm happy that the House of Rep today in the newspapers said that they are failed Nigerians. I hope you all still read that. That is good for us. It makes us to think and rethink. And my own answer is simple. If a person admits, that, admits his failure, then you look at the solution to it. The solution to it is as soon as the president, the present government, completes his term of office, do not hold a new election. Rather, let us have an interim government. Heavy words from a man held in high regard, not just in the legal sphere, but whenever topics of national issues are up for discussion. His call for an interim government, from his point of view, is necessary to resolve the predicament the nation has inadvertently placed itself. Going by the meaning, an interim government can be described as an emergency government set up during the collapse or crisis of a state. The legal icon is concerned about near daily reports of arson, banditry, kidnapping, looting, murder by terrorists and ritualists, and many other criminal activities making the headlines. You are safe on the road, you are safe in your house, you are safe in, on the farm. So those who are governing us have the duty to look into that. The conversation, however, is one that seems to pit the Abwad founder with those calling for caution. Imo State Governor Hope Uzadima believes a gap in governance may result in anarchy. By May 29th, if there is no elected government, our constitution has not provided for an interregnum. It shouldn't give a gap, otherwise you are creating room for anarchy. And what will be the process for selecting the interim government? Because after May 29, the president may not have constitutional powers to function as a president anymore. This is echoed by a member of the All Progressives Congress in Zamfara State, Abdullahi Shinkafi. This is an invitation to constitutional crisis, and this is an invitation to, 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 to cause serious political disorder in this country. So I call on each and every respected Nigerian and Nigerian 
to reject the call for convocation of international government under the expression of President Muhammad Buhari administration. But the legal icon seems to be sticking to his guns. Out of about 3,000 people who had commented, 90% support my views, particularly the young people, the unprepared people, the poor people, and those who are looking for work. They all supported me, and I'm happy about that. The last time Nigeria experienced an interim national government was in 1993, after General Ibrahim Babangida annulled the elections in June of that year. He handed over power to Chief Ernest Shunekon as interim head of state on August 27. That government was dissolved when General Sani Abacha seized power in November of the same year. All parties believe they have valid points to solving the issues, but Nigeria knows it's hurting, and only the right kind of dialogue to set peace and prosperity in motion can bring about the much-needed healing. Well, mixed reactions have trailed the decision by Nigeria's leading and opposition political parties to set the price of nomination forms for various elective offices at amounts seemingly beyond the reach of young people. While some have frowned at the situation claiming it will disenfranchise the youth, others believe such is needed to ensure only the serious-minded come forward to keep the process less cumbersome. Well, the PDP set its presidential ticket at 40 million naira and the APC at 100 million naira and this is coming after the passage of the not too young to run bill which reduced the age candidates must attain to vie for elective office. Our correspondent Victor Mathais reports. The signing of the not too young to run bill into law gave Nigerian youth hope that young people can finally vie for elective offices in the country, especially the office of the president. However, with preparations for the 2023 general elections in top gear, political parties released prizes of nomination and expression of interest forms for those intending to run for office. With the prizes for APC between 2 and 100 million naira, with a 50% discount for candidates under 40, while that of the PDP is between 600,000 naira and 40 million naira, drawing mixed reactions. If you've not been able to do, raise 1 million naira in your life, why are you looking for political office? It's almost like you're going there because you see it as a source of income. But if you've been there, done that, and got a T-shirt, and you, you have 100 million naira that you are not using, like we say in Nigeria, then you are almost kind of, you are in the class of people that are viable enough to, you know, to, to run for office. Money must never, you know, must never deter people of good conscience, good character, people who have the capacity, who have the competence from getting into public office. And I think it is unfortunate. And I call on, you know, most of these political parties, particularly the ruling party, to review this. Though the Not Too Young to Run Act has cleared the age barrier, monetary encumbrances remains one yet to be removed. In the United States, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortex, AOC, she was a buyer tender, and she was just 29. And she was able to get into, into the Congress, essentially because you do not have a quality that demands so much, you know, that demands that you have a lot of money to be able to get into, into the process, that beyond the not too young to run law, we must then proceed to what you can describe as affirmative action for young people. Because when you have a law that is not backed by the means, the law will be rendered ineffective and ineffective as we have seen in the case of the political parties because you have left completely at discretion of the political parties. While some say the parties have set these prizes to ward off on serious aspirants, others believe otherwise. There's a fundamental issue around funding of the parties. The funding of the parties should go back to the people. They should raise money traditionally from Jews. And it's not alien to the Nigerian space. In the past, uh, the political parties usually uh, had always raised money from unions and, uh, and the party members. They use the money to uh, mobilize grassroots. So in Nigeria, for example, I think there are about 747 local governments and there are about 8,000 and so, you know, voting units and stuff like that. So if you are able to simulate the nation and you are able to do some budgeting and you be able to, based on pre 
previous local national elections and stuff like that you kind of know the amount of money if this is done in america this is done in the uk you know how much you would need for grassroots according to the national women leader of the all progressives congress better edu the party set the price so high because if you pick their nomination form and you are the candidate, the probability of you becoming the elected person for that position is almost 100%. So we want only serious people who are interested in running and representing different people to run. With the cost of nomination and expression of interest forms increasing every election cycle, Nigerians are hoping that INEC as the umpire will set a limit to ensure young aspirants are not left out moving forward. Victor Mathias, Channels Television News. Well, let's explore this even further. We're joined on the news at 10 by Professor Khalifa Dikwa, as the Dean of Borno Elders, joins us live from our Meduguri studio. Uh, Prof, thank you for joining us on the news at 10. I imagine you're one of the elders in the nation who's in support of the Not Too Young to Run bill. But what is your reading of this latest trend of the you know, nomination and expression of interest form that has been described as exorbitant? Hello, Kyrie. Quite, quite some time. Um, first of all, my condolences goes to the entire people of Nigeria over the demise of a, a national elder, uh, at the Alafia of Oyo. Um, now, coming to our main uh, topic about the um, ridiculously high price of. Uh, Mm, uh, a form to pick forms for the two two leading uh, parties, APC and PDP. So I dare say that um, this is unexpected because back in 2014, when the sitting president now, even though we know that uh, Naira depreciation and so on, that notwithstanding, we do not short change quality for money. This is indirectly saying no matter your level of patriotism, no matter you, the love for your own country, it does not matter. You must get the money uh, to run. You must uh, pay it, for instance. And therefore, money m mostly can, cannot be explained in terms of uh, source of that amount. And therefore, those who have money, clean money, may not even apply to come and uh, see the wahala of Nigeria, Nigeria of today. And this amount alone is also a threat to security because it provokes the younger generation, it frustrates them, and removes the hope that they have in this country. I add to it the idleness uh, under the, the, uh, the strike of university lecturers as with agreements and so on that had not been uh, implemented, although from time to time government tends to blackmail them that they are doing it for their own sake. At that time, it was just, this one is called 2009 agreement, but it's actually we went for the same strike in 1992. And at that time, our children were not even in university. Some of the elders, were, they had their own uh, children too. Well, and prof. our children, my, my, my own inclusive, have graduated. Some of them have gone to, to other services, to the, to the military and so on. But the thing is, let me say, whether it is 40 million, uh, Coyote, or 100 million, right. it removes the thing. Alternative, they are also saying that... Um, it has to do with the logistics and so on. Election is part of governance. The country, INEC and so on, should ought to have found a way of not blocking credible people to apply to serve their own country. So this gives the impression that the youth, the younger ones, including the women who make up the majority. Yes, majority all the time. It is ridiculous to even, even think that uh, women are equal in number. They are well, always tough. above in terms of number, and they are the real voters. 
Well, Prof, and I'd like you to also... For India, where the, the, the woman, the bride, uh, pays the, the, the dowry and so on, uh, where right. some of them have to move to another religion in order to marry two, three, four. Eh? So okay. this, is, this is it. So it is discouraging, and I call it a threat to democracy. And even in my earlier uh, um, analysis that by June, if Nigeria has not been able to fix the security... They should as well uh, think of uh, putting the, the uh, a case of uh, interim government in the wrong place. The way uh, Afeba Balalo, senior advocate, uh, advocated, I, did, I said it a long time ago, because you cannot have an election under insecurity. Well, and Prof, we I'd like you to respond. This insecurity to, to fester uh, coyote. It was right. allowed to fester because in the, it is only de during democracy that this kind of thing is infiltrated from outside and government well prof because of our time I, i'd like to put in another question yes. uh pardon me i'd like to put yes, in another right. question because of our time now so this is where we are right now there are a lot of young people thinking what can i do I, I i want to at least find a way to serve my nation i want to be of service in a leadership role what would you advise young people to do now the ones faced with either 40 million or 100 million naira oh my goodness they must not lose hope in this country. This country has survived many conspiracies, internal and external. They must not be discouraged because this thing can, may not happen. May not happen because it is ridiculous and it will not happen because it will create apathy. You cannot go and vote for people who are not likely to respect you because they paid money for the seat. Uh, whether as a councillor or governor or anybody, paying huge amounts of money to run is ridiculous because the system ought to have had a way of uh, uh, taking care of the logistics, not to ask the candidates to do it. And the parties also have the way of raising money. Because it is simply because the, there is no link between the followership and the, the, the leadership of them. Otherwise, the, the uh, followership ought to have been uh, uh, contributing to get some money for the running of the parties, as it was done in the Second Republic, 19, uh, 1979. And at that time, the, the party was superior than anybody. Under NPN, for instance, under uh, Elder Adisa Akinloye. Even at that time, well, there was an instance where the President Jagari was on his way out of the country when I decided, uh, uh, Akin Loy wanted to talk to him, he had to forego that travel out. He had to go back to, to listen to the chairman. That is respect. Right. And we are coming to, when we came to 1999, the president at that time, Obasanjo, pocketed the party and the governors followed suit. Well, that is why we got it wrong. Prof, yes. as you said. So the I, youth I, must not lose hope, lose hope because with prayer, with uh, creating awareness more and more, there may be a receipt for this exam okay. where they will be given an opportunity to run and serve their own country because they are the real stakeholders for tomorrow and, I think and next. That's a and great place to anchor, are Prof. Old now who are enjoyed their own time, enjoy the, not enjoying the time of their own children, would, would love to enjoy tomorrow uh, just a plain with, with the future of this uh, and uh, this uh, with this money and so on they shouldn't allow these two masquerades to graduate into draculas and uh, dinosaurs that may consume our own democracy it Prof, is wrong and i think that's a great place verbatim, whatever democracy we copy it from outside we should have um uh, polished it get the best part suitable to our own system adopt to our own pe peculiarities make it uh, uh, less money because corruption bread and so on had had so many names in ours in other well, countries prof, clearly so, so many US. issues to, to bring up countries. on this one but, and i can but, and i can actually uh, feel the passion that you have but we have to run now prof perhaps we'll pick this up another day as usual but great place to anchor uh, prof thank you so much for your thoughts on the news at 10 this morning always very instructive we'll be speaking with professor khalifa dikwa dean of Burnu elders joining us live from our Medugari studio in Burnu state
And now to some company news. The international breweries and makers of Hero Lager Beer has continued to put smiles on the faces of consumers with various promotional and rewarding events. But this time, the company decided to promote bonding as well as celebrate the spirit of brotherliness of the Igbo people, the highest consumers of Hero Lager Beer with a program tagged One Neck Connect. Now, this is part of the international brewery's culture of interacting with consumers to understand their wants. And for one who connects, the marketing director of International Brewers PLC, Mrs. Tolu Lokwe Adedeji, says it's a celebration of the unity, love and loyalty of the Igbos in the heart of the Southeast Onicha as part of measures to appreciate their patronage. Brotherliness is a feeling of love and loyalty and it's meant to be expressed and this positive energy is what the International Breweries PLC, makers of Hero Lager Beer, brings to beer in this latest campaign, One Nay Connect. It's about our fashion, it's about our arts, it's about our spirituality and also our history. That is everything One Nay Connect is about. Bringing everybody together today to connect and from there move you know, as one people. The all-night event holding at the Chuba Ikwazu Stadium in Onicha is targeted at celebrating the uniqueness of the Igbo culture with various music groups in attendance to electrify the night with group performances. The night becomes more frenzied with excitement as brand ambassadors fill the audience with great renditions. Even the marketing director, Mrs. Tolulokwe Adedeji, catches the bug. so happy to celebrate today unity you know that our heroes um, deserve and love and what hero really stands for is about unity for brothers unity for one is right here in east south part of nigeria we we'll typically have big ticket events like this at least once in a year in the past we called hero fiesta this is about one connect so expect good things from hero laga all the time this photo shoot is part of the bonding and then some of the ambassadors share their thoughts on the concept one neck connect is a concept that brings people together that makes people commune together and then achieve result which is what they are doing a lot of people are scared they don't go out a lot of people are not happy the hardship and everything so the program is to encourage people to like connect have fun and live as one one neck connect concert Powered by Hero, the best beer, number one. As the night wears on, more brand ambassadors, including P Square, perform to the admiration of the people. <laughs> the International Breweries says it is constantly celebrating its teeming customers through its various campaigns, which includes Iba Boy campaign, Hero Fiesta, and now One Nay Connects. Well, to agriculture now, transporting farm produce in Nigeria is becoming a challenge for most farmers. Besides the poor state of roads across the country, farmers face attacks by bandits, armed robbers, as well as discriminatory taxation on the highways as they transport their farm produce from the rural areas to major cities. Our next report takes a look at how the difficulty in transporting farm produce has impacted the price of food items and causing wastage in some cases. According to the Food and Agricultural Organization, food supply and distribution system in cities involve combinations of activities, functions and relations. These activities are performed by different economic players, which include producers, assemblers, importers, transporters, wholesalers, retailers, processors, shopkeepers, street vendors and service providers amongst others. This system in Nigeria, however, is facing a disconnect as farmers have a lot to contend with. Friday is a market day of Dansado and uh, formerly we transport a bag of grains from Dansado to Gusau at the cost of 300 naira. But presently, each bag will cost you 1,500 naira, both loading and offloading. And therefore now, when you are to load a vehicle from Dansado to Gusau, it will cost you almost 230 to 250, including what is happening along the road, checking points, produce, police checking points, army checking points, 
they charge our drivers and the pump suppliers huge amount of money. The transportation challenges faced by farmers are leading to an increase in food prices and it's impacting on the federal government's food security policy. Vegetables and fruits farmers experience over 50 to 60 percent of damage while being transported from farms to urban areas. But the federal government says it has fashioned out ways to address these challenges, especially in rural areas. That is why we have the rural development uh, section in the ministry to provide good rural roads, uh, electricity, we do uh, sources of energy, water, to be able to have perishable goods can be brought to the market in good time since we have the road. And then with electricity, you can have now refrigerators and other cold storage that you can uh, put. Of course, water, whatever that needs to be washed clean, we provide water, we do dams, we do our boreholes. So there are a lot of things that the ministry is doing to make sure we safeguard farm produce. What are the alternatives that the government must consider to get its food security plan right? If you have badges to transport food, you can have one badge that can transport as much as one trailer. In other words, you could take about 30 tons in one badge. And one tugboat can pull about 10 badges. So you see, it will be cheaper to move these items by river. The federal government's food security plan aims to reduce hunger and boost foreign exchange and income for farmers. However, it will be interesting to see how it will resolve the transportation challenges. Well, let's switch gears now on the news at 10 tonight. Here's Tenila Shubawali with business news. Thanks a lot, Kaede. Welcome to Business News. Nigeria's foreign exchange reserve has sustained its upward movement, according to data from the Central Bank of Nigeria. The latest from the CBN shows that FX reserves increased by $59.9 million to $39.8 billion as at April the 20th. The rise in forex inflows can be credited to higher global crude oil prices. The Debt Management Office has offered three new federal government bonds valued at 225 billion naira for subscription by auction. The DMO says it's valued at 1,000 with a minimum subscription of 50 million naira. The three bonds attract interest rates of 13.53 and 13 percent respectively. The auction is scheduled for Monday, April the 25th. Trading activity at the FMDQ exchange was mixed this week as the total turnover of transactions carried out at the FX spot forwards and futures markets rose slightly by 3.27% to $600.41 million as at April the 22nd. A further analysis of trading results shows that total value of transactions at the FX spot market, that's the INE window, increased by 4.03% to 500 $120.60 million, while the FX derivatives market turnover fell by 1.43% to $79.81 million. Also, the Naira depreciated by 0.16% to 416 Naira, 77 Kobo against the dollar at the Nigerian Autonomous Foreign Exchange window of the Forex market, in contrast to the 416 Naira 12 Kobo recorded last week. The world's largest palm oil producer, Indonesia, has announced plans to ban palm oil exports, a shock move that could further stoke global food inflation. According to the Indonesian government, the country wants to ensure the availability of food products at home after global food inflation soared to a record high following Russia's invasion of major crop producer, Ukraine. However, the halting of shipments of cooking oil and its raw material could raise costs for packaged food producers globally. Indonesia accounts for more than half of global palm oil supply. 
And back home at the domestic equities market, bargain hunting was major this week as investors flocked into big names ahead of quarter one corporate earnings releases. Investors buying interest in Guinness, Lafarge, Airtel Africa, Seplat and Flower Mills drove the positive market action. The all share index rose by 2% in a four day trading week after crossing the 48,000 level on Wednesday. The NTD and YTD gains have also increased to 3.2 and 13.4 percent respectively. However, activity levels were weaker than the previous week as trading volumes and value declined by 7.1 percent and 26.2 percent week on week. Across sectors, the oil and gas, consumer goods, industrial goods and banking indexes closed positive while the insurance index was the sole loser. May PLC top the gainers chart for the week while Academy Press led the laggards. The trio of Fidelity Bank, Zenit Bank and Universal Insurance contributed 21.47% and 14.75% to the total volume and value traded in the week. And that's it on Business News tonight. I'm Tenyo Lashuboale. It's back to Kaya Day for the rest of the news at 10. Well, thank you, Tenny. On the foreign scene, a new case of Ebola has been confirmed in Northwestern Democratic Republic of Congo as four months after the end of the country's last outbreak. The National Institute of Biomedical Research says the case, a 31-year-old male, was detected in the city of Bandaka, the capital of Congo's Equatorial province. The patient began showing symptoms on April the 5th but did not seek treatment for more than a week. He was admitted to an Ebola treatment center on April the 21st and died later that day. The World Health Organization says that efforts to contain the disease are already underway in Mbendaka, a crowded trading hub on the banks of the Congo River, and that a vaccination campaign will begin in the coming days. Congo has seen 13 previous outbreaks of Ebola, including one in 2018 to 2020 in the east that killed nearly 2,300 people, the second highest toll recorded in the history of the hemorrhagic fever. It's an update on the Russia-Ukraine war. Officials in Odessa say at least eight people have died after several missiles rained down on the port city. An apartment block was allegedly hit among other buildings. Russia has now confirmed that it carried out strikes in the area. Well, here's more on this and other development on day 59 of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. <laughs> Residents were rescued by firefighters from a building hit by a missile strike in the Black Sea city of Odessa. At least eight people, including one child, were killed and 18 wounded in the strike. The crucial port city has until now escaped the worst of Russia's continuing assault on Ukraine. In the southern city of Mariupol, Efforts to help civilians leave have once again been thwarted, with both sides blaming each other for breaking a deal to run a humanitarian corridor. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky warns Russia that Ukraine would be dropped from peace talks if its soldiers defending Mariupol steel plant were killed, or if Russia held any of its planned referendums on independence in occupied Ukrainian areas. Earlier, a video was published appearing to show women and children sheltering in a bunker under the steel plant where the last Ukrainian defenders are holding out. In the east, local authorities say fierce fighting is raging across Kharkiv and Luang's regions. In northern Ukraine, new figures released by local authorities have given a sense of the civilian death toll in the region. Officials in Bucha say 412 bodies have been recovered following the Russian occupation. And in Chernihiv, more than 700 civilians are said to have been killed when Russian troops took over earlier in the war. And finally, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin are to visit Kiev on Sunday to hold talks with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. The visit will be the first visit by a U.S. official to Ukraine since the war began. Well, let's now check out the latest sports stories with Chris Lems.
opening boxing, Tyson Fury defeats Dillian White via knockout to retain his WBC and linear heavyweight titles. The Gypsy King knocked out his British rival in round six to end the fight. Fury remains unbeaten after 33 fights as a professional boxer. And um, in the English Premier League, Arsenal defeated Manchester United 3-1 at the Emirates Stadium in the early kickoff. In other matches, Leicester City and Aston Villa played out a goalless draw at the King Park Stadium. Gabriel Jesus scored four goals as Manchester City thrashed Watford 5-1 to move four, four points clear at the top of the table. Elsewhere, Newcastle United moved into the top half and sent Norwich City closer to relegation after beating the Canaries 3-0 at Carrow Road. In the last game of the day, Tottenham dropped out of the top four after being held to a goalless draw by Brentford. That's Sports News. I'm Chris Lems. It's back to you, Kaidi. Thank you, Chris. And the main news again. Oba Lamidi Adeyemi III, who died on Friday after over five decades on the throne, has been buried, according to Islamic rites. And it was an outpouring of tributes from the President Muhammad Buhari and other leaders who described him as a nationalist and a former custodian of tradition and culture. We also brought you a report on reactions to Afeba Balala's call for an interim government in the country, though a discordant tune some for and others against. And that's the news at 10 tonight, everyone. Thank you for watching. I'm Kairo Kikili. Good night.